Let's ask the question, where do you rank right now? And this is for you personally in your industry. There are some six or seven levels at which you might peg yourself. And the chances are, it's not just going to be one level. It's very likely that you, you will find yourself somewhere between two of these ideas. In this room, we will have no one on the bottom rung, which is rank novice. The person who is brand new, just came into the industry, they're looking around wide-eyed, they don't understand the world around them. This is generally your first job. And often it's not the thing that you've invested your heart in, not the thing you've decided to do with your, your life. It's something you do to earn a little money to get started. It's working experience. And this person is characterized by total reactivity. They have no idea what they're doing, but they can do what they're told to do, and then they idle and stall and wait for their next set of commands. You do that long enough, and eventually you become a working drone, which is a little bit better. A working drone is starting to understand the world around them. They now have an idea of what's going on in their department, their division, their world, but still they remain very reactive. They have to be told what to do. This is not a person who is innovating, pioneering, or showing leadership skills yet. Keep that up long enough, you get a little more experience, you graduate to practitioner. Now often this is where most people find themselves in their career, and most people are very happy to stop at practitioner. This is a person who takes their work seriously. They have a good degree of situational awareness, they understand how the divisions work together, they even comprehend how the whole industry works and how the whole machine makes money. But once again, they're not necessarily leading the way, they're not pioneering, they don't have their own unique thoughts about what should change in this industry. And that hints at what comes next, and that is specialist. Now, specialist is starting to go to a whole different level. This is a person who not only has the experience, but is starting to understand what's wrong with an industry and how to change it. This person might be employed, but they might not be. They could be their own boss by this stage. They might have their own practice, and they might be out there starting to react to things like invitations to speak in public. This is a person with a high degree of knowledge and someone who is starting to innovate. Now keep that up long enough and it begins to become a little more special. After that, you get the authority. This is the person that everyone says, oh, you should go and talk to her. He's the guy that you need to talk to. This is the person who understands this world backwards and forwards. And that again is characterized by a shift from doing a function to thought leadership. It goes way beyond just doing the job and it starts becoming speaking to the industry and showing where things should be going. Keep that up long enough and you become the Schwarzenegger of bodybuilding, the Branson of business, the Clarkson of cars, the Oprah of TV. You become the icon in that industry. People can't talk about bodybuilding without referencing Schwarzenegger. And that is unusual and it's astonishing. How do they do those things? That's what we're after. Now let's talk about this from a brand perspective. What happens with the organization? Well, a brand can start off as a fly-by-night operator. That's the worst kind of business. That's hit and run. That's sell and run. That's someone who's trying to make a quick buck. It is characterized by um, the dishonesty, it's an unethical business practice. It is not oriented around the customer. One level up, you get something that is ethical, but not necessarily very effective. And that we will call the mom and pop store. These are good folks. They take what they do seriously, but they don't have much reach. And they are very much reacting to whoever comes to them. That's the size, that's the scale of their operation. Beyond that, we get the professional operation. That's most companies. That's most businesses, most brands. They're good at what they do. Well, would they have my back in a pinch? Eh, they're good at what they do. And that's about all we can say. So the professional operation is where most businesses tend to get and they don't go beyond that. We have some interesting opportunities and threats at that level because you can either go from there to being the massive blind bureaucracy or you can go from there to being the faceless corporation or if you do it well, you can go from there to becoming the dynamic problem solver. And that's very different. That takes a lot of design, a lot of intelligence, and a lot of effort that says, even though we're growing in scale, we're taking our mission seriously. Our scale is not going to get in the way. It doesn't hamper what we do. Keep that up long enough, you become the direction determining voice. It's a very complex way of saying exactly the same thing about you as an individual. It's a thought leader. 
This is an organization that is not just doing business, it's out there changing things in nations. And finally, you become the synonym for industry excellence. People walk into a small store and they say, I'm going to go buy a Coke. They come out with a Fanta and they see no contradiction in that because they went and bought a Coke. Coke becomes synonymous for that world. You don't vacuum something, you hoover up your carpet. It is when people think about your industry, they only think of your name. So this one is not a, a yell it out loud, but where are you right now? Personally, where would you peg yourself on that scale? And what's the next step up for you? And where would you peg the organization? depending on where you're viewing it from around the world. That's what we're interested in here today. So, let's start with a bigger, broader question then. Why bother to become the top name? We're going to dissect what these names do differently, how you can do it, and there are some surprising and counterintuitive answers to this one. But let's start by asking, why bother being anything but a competent professional working in a competent professional organization? Well, I believe there are at least four reasons it's worth your while. In the book, you'll find some 15 reasons I think it's important to become a, a top name, but I'll share four with you this morning. The first and most obvious one is that experts earn exponentially more. The income is much greater. When you're the top name, the top brand, the reputable version of, you can charge more and people expect it and they will pay it. They also believe that they are getting their value by paying it. It is not a con, it is a position at the top levels of industry. The second reason is maybe a little more noble. Uh, who here has kids? Show hands. And feel free to raise your hand if there's a very good chance. <laughs> yeah, right, most of us. I've got a little two-year-old, he's turning three in, uh, in a few days' time. And it's the most wonderful thing when you see ideas sort of start to take root, things that he's trying to figure out and, and the penny drops. Um, those moments where you help and explain something to him, he gets it and his world becomes a little bigger. He's able to do things that he wasn't able to do before, just because you showed him how. There's something wonderfully gratifying about that. And the same thing applies in, in this sense as well. If you've ever coached someone, mentored someone, helped them to grow to the next level, there's nothing quite like that moment where the penny drops and they can increase the amount of levers available to them. They can do more because of you. As an industry thought leader and as an icon, you do that on a grand scale. You're no longer just a cog in a system, you are part of the voice driving where the whole industry is going. And where there are things you don't like, you're one of the people pioneering better ways forward. And that means something, that's, that's the stuff of legacy, it's gratifying. That's reason number two. Reason number three is it radically overhauls how you go about your sales and marketing. And it's a simple switch from they, you have to go to them to sell one item at a time to they come to you because you're the trusted name in. That really is what we're after here. That's what every entrepreneur, every business wants, is people walking in the door and your biggest problem is trying to cope with how much business is coming to you. And when the problem arises, people go, that's the person to talk to. Well, that's reason number three. And reason number four is one I've been kind of playing with and thinking about recently, and it's this. When you are the top expert, the top icon, the top brand name, you arrive to find the door already open. Let me explain what I mean by that one. The, the book you see in front of you is published by Penguin in Johannesburg. Now that's book number, I think, six out of some seven that we've done. And the first time I approached Penguin, they didn't know me from a bar of soap. I was a, a new speaker, new author, and I had to do everything the cold, formal way. Everything by the rules and everything with the barriers and the red tape. And it plays out like this. You send a very politely worded email saying, this is my idea for a book, may I send you a synopsis? And it disappears off into Neverland. And perhaps if you're lucky, a few weeks later, you get a very curt, coldly worded email from a non-committal editor saying, thank you very much for your proposal. Please send through your synopsis. And if you haven't heard from us in six months, please carry on with your life. So you send it through and you hope and you pray and there's just radio silence for a couple of months. Then you get another very formally, cautiously worded email that says, please send us the first three chapters of your manuscript. And if you haven't heard from us in six months, please continue with your life. And so it goes. And eventually, after going through this very formal process, at one point, they eventually said, yes, come into the office, meet with us. I can remember just how excruciating it was going through all the red tape, the rules, and the formality, and it's slow. Then we get to book number six, 
And by this stage, I've built a relationship with them. They've sent me on things like radio interviews and TV interviews and so on, and I lived up to my side of the bargain and promoted them, done a good job, been a faithful steward, all those good things they expect. And this is how the situation changes. I have the idea for book number seven, and I go, Hi, Ronell, hope your week is going well. I've got this idea for a book. It would be something down these lines. Said. Five minutes later. Doug, sounds good. We'll publish it in February. Done. That's it. All of the doors, all of the barriers, all of the obstacles are swept aside because the authority figures can do that. So here's an interesting question. In your world right now, what are the formal barriers, the doors, the obstacles in your way that are only there because they don't know and trust you well enough yet? What would change if you could have that email back in five minutes? So those are some of the reasons it's worth your while to become a top expert. You earn more, you get to change things, you're a voice in the industry, the business comes to you and the doors are already open. Your whole playing field changes. Let's look at how you actually start practically going about that. And after studying this for some 10 years and writing a couple of books on it, I've come to believe that the expert formula is actually quite simple. But most people miss it. Experts exist at the intersection of three qualities. Now here's the key to this one. You've got to have all three or you disqualify yourself as an expert. And most people fixate on one and don't even think about the other two. All right, so what have we got here? The one on the left-hand side is the one we always think of when we think expert. What do you reckon that? That depends. Knowledge, yes. Okay, so knowledge, you've got to have the knowledge. And we use knowledge as a catch-all term for everything. Competence, ability, uh, qualifications. You may not necessarily have to have the most qualifications, but you've got to have entrance into the game. The knowledge, the ability, the know-how, it's all got to be there, or you cannot be an expert. That's, that's quite straightforward. The one that most people miss is the one on the top, and that is, weirdly, both Nigella Lawson and Jeremy Clarkson. What do you reckon that is? Sex appeal. Okay, so Clarkson's out. That's why. <laughs> That's why I chucked him in there. Yeah, yeah six of you might be part of it, but I don't think Jeremy Clarkson could be accused of that. So what are we going to call that? Personality. Personality, absolutely. A broad phrase there is personality. It's the human stuff, it's the storytelling, it's the personality, it's the connection. And it can be different for everyone. It might be, it might be the human, it might be the emotion, it might be the passion. It's that something human that makes what you do come alive. And the last one is publicity. Knowledge, personality, publicity. Top experts, top icons have all three of those and they take them on a roadshow. And it's amazing how much depth you can go into when you start from that basic framework and work outwards. But without all of the parts in place, you disqualify yourself as an expert. So here's the formula to remember for this one. If you have all of the knowledge, but no personality, you are a specialist. If you have all of the personality, but no knowledge, you are a Kardashian. <laughs>